I'm going to use this video as a means to try to help you work your way through interpreting some of the findings in the Capsim Cario, which will be your go-to report after each round to sort of assess what you're doing as well as what the competition is doing. Uh, I will periodically post these videos during the course of the semester, but now after two complete practice rounds, uh, I thought I'd give you my observations. I also understand that because these are practice rounds, your results may be somewhat skewed in the fact that you were using it just to learn how things interacted and worked. However, upon review, the first place I look for is page one, which is the selected financial statistics. And as we can see here, Chester is not doing real well with an emergency loan of um, $63 million. However, to their credit, it is actually an improvement because they did have an emergency loan in round one of $140 million. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the situation, all emergency loans have to be paid back in full uh, in the, current, the following round. So that means that before Chester could even make any money, anything that they had in the way of profit had to go to paying off the $140 million loan, emergency loan from the prior round in this round. Um, the result being that they still ended up with a $63 million emergency loan. Now it is interesting when you further examine what's going on with them to see that they actually had the highest sales of $176 million. The problem becomes right here, contribution margin, and only 21% contribution margin. For all planning purposes, you should really try to achieve a contribution margin of around 30 or more percent. Um, the other issue that sort of flagrantly jumps out here is that um, Chester had 18.1% spent in SG&A. Uh, again, that's a little high. Um, Baldwin was a little high. Um, Digby just around, but Baldwin and Erie both, because usually no more than about 15%, 10 to 15%, 12 to 15% is probably the, the sweet spot. Anything above that, you may be spending more money than, you, than the return value you're receiving. Anything less than that may not be giving you sufficient bang for the bucks. So as we can see, um, if you look at in an example Baldwin with the sales of $137 million, if they had spent slightly less on the SG&A, they in all probability would have been profitable for the round. Next, I usually jump down to page three of the report, which is giving you the financial summaries. I'm looking at the various items here in the cash flow. Uh, as we can see, Chester did in fact make an investment in capacity, well, whereby of about $3 million, ironically, Digby appeared to sell off about $5 million in capacity, um, freeing up cash. Now this is sort of an interesting area to look at, this entire section in through here, because it's telling us how an organization has used its money. So you can pay dividends, you can sell, you know, you can sell common stock on the market, you can purchase back, um, you can receive long-term debt financing, um, you can retire that, you can retire from current debt. Now you notice that in uh, Chester's case, that one point, that $150 million emergency loan showed up as current debt in this round and had to be retired. And then there was cash from current debt borrowing, and then they still needed another $63 million. So from here I can see that um, you know, there's really a balancing act that needs to go on between what is spent particularly in the areas of capital improvements and plant and the like, and how that's financed. Remember, there should be a matching between borrowing types and asset types. So anything like plant improvement, which is a long-term capital asset, should usually be financed using long-term debt and not necessarily from operating capital because you obviously will not have in most cases sufficient operating capital to cover those type of things and day-to-day -day activities should be um, financed from operating capital. You know, I'll take a moment here and sort of explain to you what I consider the the three bears approach to three aspects debt, cash, and inventory. In all cases 
you can either have too little, you know, too little cash, um, hinders your way to operate. Too little inventory means you don't have product to sell. And too little debt may mean that you're using too much of your own assets. Obviously, too much debt is also a bad thing because of the carrying costs associated with that debt. Too much inventory is bad because A, you're not making sales, and B, that asset is sitting around non-performing and collecting dust and even costing you in the form of carrying costs. And too much cash, ironically, is an indication of poor management as well because it means you're sitting on an asset that's underperforming. And we can see this is the case with Digby where they're sitting on $41 million in cash. Now, that's not to say that that is necessarily too much, but one needs to think about the bigger picture. So what we need to strive for in all these three cases is that just right number. The unfortunate occurrences that I can't give you, nor is there a magic formula of what that right magic number is. That will differ from organization to organization, coupled with the, the strategy in which the organization is employing. So, again, as we carry on down and look, we do see a couple of other issues here. We can see that Chester also has too much inventory in the form of $74 million when you compare that with everybody else. Um, the only company that's even close is Erie with $37 million, and that's um, not even quite half of the same amount. The other problem we see here, of course, is Digby, as I mentioned before, with the $41 million in cash. That may, in fact, be too much cash, but only time will tell. Moving a little further down the page into the income statement section, we begin to see what's happening. And the irony of it all is, is that Chester's sales are amongst the highest, and they were even around one of all the companies, by a significant margin, I might add. The problem becomes that their variable costs are very high, comparatively speaking. Their SG&A is also very high. These things combined ended up putting them into a severe loss situation. Next, I usually go down to page four in the report. This is telling us um, a lot about what your production capabilities are and how things are measured. As we can see, um, Chester did, in fact, sell quite a number of units. Their problem is their inventory is still excessive, which means they have all this product sitting around. The only product for Chester that actually seems to be working is the low product Cedar, where they sold 2,500, they only have 400 and inventory, but equally important, it was amongst one of their better contribution margins at 22%. Um, still, the numbers are not favorable in their case. When we look at all of the companies this round, we begin to see that the only problem that we had is bread stocked out on, on low, which means that they were doing a good job, that product was well positioned, but by stocking out, they, they had a loss opportunity. They could not continue selling into the remainder of this round and, in fact, would be barred initially until they get more product produced from selling in the current round, which is, again, a lost opportunity count. We say, see the same situation occurring for Digby with the Dixie product as well as the DIM product. Um, in so other cases that we see here, uh, we go down to Erie, we see that um, in some cases, like their Echo product, their high product right here, they almost have as much an inventory as they sold, so there are some issues there that need to be taken into account. So, taking looking at the various items like revision date, age, all of these, these factors here are the various buying criteria that come into play, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. The other things to keep in mind are the capacity for next round. This number can be a little misleading in so much as that what that capacity number is representing is a single shift. And in reality, you have two shifts available to you. So taking a look at Baker's product for um, Baldwin, you'll see that they're showing capacity of 1,800 units. Well, in reality, what they really have capacity for is twice that amount of 3,600 units. Now, we step down further and we see that bread is a topic, a product that really 
is sort of in the sweet spot. They had capacity for actually 2,800 units, but they're at 192 percent. So in this case, this is where you begin to look at should I add additional capacity um, in that product area. The same holds true with Chester and the Aceta product. They're at 196 percent. So obviously there's going to be a limitation to how much they can produce going forward. Uh, so once, you know, there is certain profitability to get into the second round, because a uh, second shift rather, because you're not incurring any additional fixed costs per se in the form of um, you know new equipment, but um, so it can be much more profitable. So you want to look at that and really not begin to consider um, increasing capacity until you're about at the 150 percent or higher mark in a particular product. There are a couple of other things to take into account. This automation issue. This is one of the areas where you can get the maximum bang for your buck. By investing in automation, you lower your overall labor costs, which will greatly contribute towards improving your contribution margin, which also shows up here for each of these products going down. So this, this picture really does present a good oversight of how you're doing vis-a-vis -vis your competition and also gives you maybe a beginning sense of what the competition is trying to accomplish. Next I'm going to take a look at slide five. Now this is just the traditional uh, market. You really need to look at each of the five of these uh, for each of the various markets to understand, but I'm going to use this for illustration purposes alone. First of all, at the very top up here, we're seeing what the industry demand was and what the sales were. So for this in, in this particular industry, um, there was a demand for 8,776 products. That total demand was met. And interestingly, from your entire product mix, that represents 30.3% of the total market for all products combined. Now, what is also interesting here is this helps you plan for the coming round. So you can look at these two numbers and you can say, all right, if there was this current round had a total demand of 87.76 and I have a growth rate of 9.6%, I can begin to figure out what the total demand will be for the next round by multiplying the 87.76 times 1.096, and that number will tell you how much total demand there is for the market. Now you need to translate that and extrapolate that in for how much of the total demand your company can have and there are other ways of doing that. The other important thing that's uh, on this page is it's telling you what the buying criteria are, what the customer is looking for, how they want to buy in this particular market segment. So here they're telling you that for the traditional customer age is the most important it's 47% weighted towards the entitled decision make that is being made um, for the course. On price, they're giving you a price range of from $19 to $29. It, it's weighed 23% of the total decision. And one of the interesting factors is, is once you go beyond that range in either direction, every 50 cents will cost you 10% in market share in one direction or the other. Um, we're also telling you about um, size, position, performance, and reliability. Another thing that this chart tells you is this section here, the perceptual map. And this is very insightful in the sense that anything in the solid line here, those products are smack dab in the sweet spot for the market. Any product outside obviously is not. Now there's a line here, there's a rough cut, which is still somewhat acceptable but rapidly falling out. So as we can see, cake is an example right here, is ideally suited, and if we were to look down a little further on the report, we'd probably see that yes, cake is a dominant player. As we can see right here, it had 19% market share, uh, followed by days, eat, and baker, all of them which are in here. Then you begin to move out, we can see that cedar still has some viability, but Ebb and Dell are already outside of even the rough cut and no longer fit into this market segment. Keep in mind that after each round, this shifts downward towards the right. So this means you have to constantly be aware of where your products are, what their criterions are, their configurations, and make the appropriate adjustments. Otherwise, it's very easy to see 
that in next go round, if nothing was to be done, cedar would move outside of even the rough cut and no longer be a viable product within that mix. Also down here, you get a sense of one of the reasons why cake might have been so successful, as you can see coming across, is they spent $2,500 to create 100% customer awareness. They had a sales budget of 35 for 93 and 39% uh, customer survey satisfaction. Though the interesting thing is that that's not the highest. Um, right below them, Days was at 43%, and they achieved that by not spending nearly as much on the promo or sales budget. So you could begin to say that I would argue that for all intent and purposes, um, Chester spent too much money right there in the sales budget and possibly even too much in the promo budget. Was 100% awareness necessary? The only time would tell. I next like to drop down to slide 10, or page 10, if you will, on the report. It's this report, or this um, page, that gives me information about really what's going on in the overall market, because it's showing me what is the potential market share and what was the actual. So as we can begin to see, in spite of everything um, going on with Chester, originally they were supposed to, they were geared that they were going to capture 22.1 percent of the total available market. They in fact did a little bit better at 22.6 and you know 25.8 versus 25.9 in traditional. They did slightly better in low. They were supposed to do 16.3. They actually did 17.3. Um, 29.6 so they did a little better in high versus 28.6 and they were right on in performance and uh, on the size market. So one of the things I can see is that there are the, one of the problems going on with Chester is not so much with market identification and product. That seems to be right on target, but rather now that it makes me dwell, dwell in even further into the overall criteria and how they're spending their money and utilizing all of their assets. So this report does give you a sense of, um, you know, I sort of call it my lunch um, report because it's telling me who ate whose lunch. And as an example, I can look down here and I can see that, um, you know, in many cases, you know, Baker came in or Baldwin came in slightly less, not much, 1%, but who took that 1%? I can see it was probably nibbled away at by all the other teams. There was no any one significant place where it was taken, so there was just a little bit of nibbling. This is a very, very competitive industry, as I can see, given these type of numbers. One of the final pages I look at is page 11, and this is the perceptual map that takes all five products into account. And as we can see, right now it does not appear that any of the products are in trouble. But again, remember as mentioned when we talked about the traditional, this whole graph will slide to the bottom right over time. Having said that, then I would suggest that Dell if it is not taken care of, if not appropriate moves are made, would slide out of the in, being in the solid area and move out into the rough cart and become less viable. You can see that these products here have the potential of moving into the next um, product area if they are not advised. Now, you could be one that you, want, you don't want to revise them, you want to move them there. So, I mean, there are a number of different strategic issues that do come into play. I hope in closing that this gives you a little bit of insight on how to interpret the report and how to begin to look things for a little bit more detail and understanding. As a reminder, this was the end of the second practice round. None of your decisions, none of your results from this round get carried forward. Everything gets reset back to the very beginning as you start the real rounds coming forward. Good luck to all of you.